From high atop the Mott Foundation building in Flint, Michigan, I'm criminal defense attorney Michael Manley, and I am here with Manley's Law. My co-host today is Lindsay Whisker, the lovely Lindsay Lou. Hello. She is the pulse <laughs> of the people, and I am so honored to have as our guest today from Flint, Michigan, attorney Bruce Leach. Well, Welcome, thank you very, Bruce. thank you very much, Michael. I'm uh, honored to be here today. This is uh, an exciting uh, topic for today's discussion on the eve of adult use uh, legalization in Michigan. Well, uh, this podcast is going to cover many, many different areas, and uh, with Michigan just passing recreational use of marijuana, I wanted to bring in an expert uh, in this area. And uh, I would consider that you, Bruce. Uh, you have built and earned a great reputation here in Flint and Genesee County uh, as a cannabis lawyer, somebody who uh, has represented people in the medical marijuana community, not only individuals charged with crimes, but also the corporate level of making sure that people were doing things proper. Well, I really appreciate those uh, kind words, Michael. It's, it's been a, a, a labor of love and a passion of mine uh, ever since I first got into the field of cannabis law, uh, having some personal experiences with individuals who had severe uh, you know, medical conditions and their experiences with cannabis that and eventually led to some of them being cured and uh, drastically improving the quality of life, it was a real eye-opener and something that um, kind of sparked my desire to help people in this arena. Well, one of the things I want to do is just introduce you to uh, our audience because I think uh, with the changes in the law, they're gonna need people like you and I to help them. And I also have Lindsay here to call BS on both of us if we, yeah. uh, <laughs> if we uh, get a little out of hand. But uh, again, we are high atop the Mott Foundation building, and once this law, we may be higher atop the Mott <laughs> Foundation building. Sounds uh, good. But uh, Bruce, you originally are from uh, the Flint area, Grand Blanc High School, and ended up going, uh, I believe, to Syracuse for college, correct? That's right. Uh, born and raised in Grand Blanc, and then I chose Syracuse for my undergraduate degree, and I was a uh, studying television, radio, and film production, and a dual major in Spanish. At the time, I finally figured out I wanted to go to law school and be a trial lawyer. Because, oh. uh, I uh, was very drawn to the legal system and helping people find justice in a system that had so many flaws and treated people differently and unfairly in a lot of circumstances. So I felt this was something that I could do and take upon myself to try to, you know, as you do, uh, find justice for our clients. Right. And uh, when we, our type of law, criminal law, trial lawyers, uh, it's very, very competitive. And you actually played uh, Division One sports. Uh, you swam at Syracuse. Isn't that true? Yeah, I uh, had a great experience my first year at Syracuse. I was on the uh, varsity swim team there. And uh, it was quite an eye-opening experience, you know, pushing yourself very hard and beyond the levels that you really thought you could ever do before. But, you know, the, the power of the mind and overcoming those challenges uh, is pretty amazing. Oh. And uh, I spent my first year there on the team, and we had several individuals that ended up swimming in the uh, Australia Olympics in 2000 for Serbia and Croatia who were on the team. And I spent most of the year trying to keep up with them in practice. Uh, oh. they, they were pretty impressive swimmers, and uh, it was a little out of my league, but it was a great experience in life and one that I cherish. And uh, I'll go to the pulse of the people. Look how big he is now. How do you yeah. think he'll do? Good. You think he can still yeah. swim? Oh, uh, Yeah. Potentially. All right. <laughs> but he was talking about doing CrossFit. That's yeah. what we were talking about a little bit earlier. So that might be something to segue into, you know, swimming. Who knows? Well, Absolutely. I'm going to tell a little secret. I've actually done CrossFit with this gentleman. That's right. We have. <laughs> brute strength. That's all yeah. I can say. Not a lot of grace, but I don't know. brute Do you, strength. I'm trying to keep can up you with you, swim Mike? well with a lot of muscle? Like, well, absolutely. I, I still actually compete in triathlons every year as okay. a fitness test. So okay. I do. In April, they have the South Beach Triathlon where I went to law school at University of Miami. Okay. And uh, I do the uh, South Beach Triathlon there. It's a mile swim, 26-mile bike, and a six-mile run. And then in August, at the end of the season, is Chicago. So those are the two yeah. events that I try to do annually. That's you where almost... I'd fail is that swim. Uh, <laughs> doggy paddle. <laughs> Well, that's okay. That's all right. It'd be a very cute doggy uh, pal. Yeah, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, with our jobs, I think you have to have that uh, outlet because it's very, very stressful. And uh, there's a lot of anxiety in our jobs, a lot of depression. We see a lot of depression. And that kind of segues into the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes and now in Michigan for recreational purposes. And again, I wanted you to be on Manley's Law so we could tell our audience what to expect out here. 
because I have a feeling you and I are going to be very, very busy. You on the corporate end and helping people set up proper businesses in compliance with the law and probably both of us for impaired drivings and things like that where I think the police are going to try to crack down because you know it's not going to be easy. Yeah, that's that's unfortunately true and, and something that I think is fairly predictable. You know, throughout the history of the original Medical Marijuana Act, um, there have been numerous areas of a poorly written law that had to be decided in the courts. And unfortunately, the vast majority of those times uh, across the state, the law was applied and interpreted uh, unequivocally, uh, asymmetrically. The defenses, uh, the prosecutions varied from town to town and county to county. So it was very difficult for a layperson to understand and remain compliant with the law because the definition of compliance changed depending on where you were located in Michigan. Unfortunately, this led to you know, a lot of unnecessary and uh, what I feel was malicious prosecution in certain areas. We are very favor uh, fortunate here in Genesee County to have an excellent prosecutor's office and judiciary where, you know, in my experience dealing with these cases here, they've always been fair. And uh, I think that that's something important and, and definitely worth uh, recognition that, uh, you know, Genesee County, tip of a hat to them for being so fair and understanding and really seeking justice more than convictions. And I would agree. Uh, I've done criminal law and marijuana cases as you have across the state. And it was very frustrating uh, that there was no clarity in the law. And you would have somebody that thought they were doing things right, thought they were following the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, thought they were in compliance and the police would rush in, take all their product, seize all their property, seize their home, and try to forfeit everything they had, and they really had no money to fight, and they lost everything that they had put their life savings in without due process of law. And we saw, I think we both can agree, yeah. uh, some abuses. Would yeah. you agree with that? Absolutely. That's one of the biggest travesties of the Medical Marijuana Act and, and the result of you know, law enforcement who is you know, particularly biased and, and opposed to any form of marijuana. Uh, the civil forfeiture is just an abomination. And taking people's property and livelihoods without any you know, real criminal justification. In many of those circumstances, and as you know, defending these all criminal cases, it's innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And in this scenario of a medical marijuana patient or caregiver, it really became more like a civil case because in order to avail yourself of the defense of the Medical Marijuana Act, you had to present evidence. You had to present your case on why your, your specific medical condition and fact scenario fit the protections of the law. So it really kind of turned the criminal justice system on its head. Uh, rather than being innocent until proven be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, you now had to prove your innocence. So looking at it from that light and understanding that the average layperson, I mean, heck, let alone judges and lawyers can't agree on what the right. law means and how it's interpreted, how can the, it's not fair to expect the average person to understand it and be able to remain compliant with it, especially when so many of the gray areas were determined by cases, sometimes on a monthly basis. Right. And there were updates from the Court of Appeals or from the Supreme Court on very key issues. And I mean, unless you're on a listserv getting those cases handed out to you fresh off the press, uh, it's very difficult to keep up with as as an average patient or caregiver might. And there was a couple things that uh, I'd like to point out, and I agree with you about Genesee County. Uh, we would have conversations with the prosecutor's office, conversations with local police officers. Um, we're very lucky to have the police forces that we have here in Genesee County. Absolutely. Uh, and they were frustrated because there was no clarity uh, in the law. Uh, so that's the first point that I really thought they tried, and I thought they were law enforcement was doing their best. But it was frustrating for all of us, including the judges, because there was no roadmap for us. Yeah, and, and the lack of roadmap is troubling for all sides. Uh, you know, from law enforcement perspective, from the bench, uh, amongst our own defense community, uh, it's it was met with varying ranges of perspectives and positions because nobody understood it. So they they didn't know where am I supposed to start and what's the path to follow. And so that's where you know people like yourself, myself, and there's you know I'm I'm one of many excellent cannabis attorneys in the state of Michigan that have put their lives and practice and dedicated to helping people in this area. 
Uh, many of them were involved with the uh, committee or the proposal to regulate marijuana like alcohol, which has just passed. So I would give my uh, uh, a nod of appreciation to those people who put in all that work. It's too many to name individually, but you know, those people really have helped to spur change and advance the, the state of the law in Michigan. And really, it's for the benefit of the patients. Right. And so... You know, kind of coming into now where we have the regu- the proposal one that has passed with adult use, uh, it changes a lot of things, but certain things remain the same. Some of the most important ones right out of the gate are the ability for people to possess up to 10 ounces and to use it still on private property or in an appropriate adult use scenario. Um, and I, I like to call it adult use better than recreational use because it implies that you should use it responsibly and like an adult. And I think that's important to remember. Uh, for anybody that's you know looking to right. uh, get started tomorrow on the eve of legalization. Well, let's go back. First of all, um, again, you're very humble. I think you're the best cannabis lawyer. That's why well, I asked you. you to be on uh, my show. <laughs> uh, your reputation precedes you. Um, hmm. I think one of the things in medical marijuana that people didn't understand that it was, and a, and a couple things I want to point out before you, you answer, first of all, it was never legal federally. Right. So if they wanted to selectively enforce it with federal law, they could have. And two, um, it never made the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act never made marijuana legal. It just gave, pursuant to Section 6 and 8, gave you a legal defense to possess certain amounts or grow certain amounts. So we've kind of now opened the door from a legal defense to having marijuana actually be legal by state law. Do you see a difference in the two? Absolutely. There's a big difference, um, and, and you hit it right on the head. You know, there are different protections for someone who's a patient or a caregiver versus someone who's going to be using it uh, recreationally or as an adult. And I think for those people who are patients and caregivers, I think it's important to maintain that status as a patient and a caregiver because there are those additional legal protections. Um you know, there's a lot of uncertainty as to how this law is going to play out. There's already been some proposed amendments from the legislature about, uh, you know, eliminating or limiting home grow abilities. Um, the, the, the lawmakers were unable to come up with this law on their own. Therefore, the people put forth the proposal that passed and it was voted and approved by the will of the people. But the legislators still want to, you know, have their two cents on it and try to amend certain things that were you know, spent a great deal of time and effort and, and forethought and foresight into planning and, and putting into the law the way it's currently written. So I think it needs to stay the way it is for now. Um, but, you know, there's always the opposition that's going to try to challenge certain things. But the difference is going to be clear when you're a patient or a caregiver, you still have the protections of the Medical Marijuana Act. And depending on which county or city you might be in, the enforcement levels will be different. The, the police are going to treat it differently. And the prosecutor's office will treat it differently. I mean, you know, many cases that we've dealt with in Genesee County or some other uh, more friendly counties have been uh, treated fairly, treated just. We've, we've either won dismissals or earned uh, the respect of the prosecutor to agree with our position and dismiss the case voluntarily. In other counties, it's not that way. Right. I mean, you know, our neighboring county to the south, they like to put people in jail or prison uh, for first offenses if they can. Well, a lot of politicians like to legislate morality. And, uh, you know, we are the land of the free. It was voted upon. Uh, I think what you have said is that this new law, the recreational marijuana, uh, that will be legal does not overtake or set aside the Medical Marijuana Act. There's still going to be the medical marijuana. That's correct. And I think it's, there's a few predictable moves that I think are going to be made by the legislature. And one happened last week and Senator Mikoff put forth the uh, proposal to eliminate home grows. Now that we have a, a commercial or the beginnings of a commercial marijuana and cannabis industry in Michigan, um, the government can get their tax money out of it. And of course, the, we all know that the government wants, that's the big reason why it took so long to regulate this industry was they had to figure out how they can tax it and get the money out of it. Fix so, our roads. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it'd be great if they're, if they're going to use it for that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have high hopes for uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> use of the funds. <laughs> Uh, to put into the right areas and and fix the things that need it, schools, uh, roads, infrastructure, things like that. I mean, especially being from the Flint area, this is something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. Mm -hmm. I think one of the arguments that was made uh, was to tax it. So the the pro-marijuana people were saying this is going to fix the roads. And I want to go to the pulse of the people over here with uh, Miss Lindsay uh, with respect to one of the things that 
I have seen, and I'm sure Bruce has seen too, is that the misuse of the medical marijuana sure. by young people from your generation. Uh, I would get so many young people that came into my office that everybody had a sore back, everybody had to have a medical marijuana card. And uh, I guess somebody my age really doesn't relate to the usage of marijuana. What, what are you seeing with people your age uh, using marijuana right now? Well, you know, I, I was never really around it much, but I did, you know, come in contact with it more when I was in high school. It was something that the people were doing, you know, it was, oh, it's illegal, but we're still going to do it. And then when it became a medical, like, problem, you know, the, the medical marijuana cards started coming out and they started to become more prevalent with all the medical marijuana uh, pop-up shops that you see more frequently and more frequently. Um, so it, it was something that I've always been exposed to, but, um, you know, I'm, it's something that we're still so, it's vague. It's a very vague bill, and we didn't know what was legal, what was not, you know? So even having you guys talk about this in layman's terms would be helpful for people that are still, that are my age and are still unknowing going forward. So yeah, that, I would say that's about dead on from what I've seen from the vast majority of clients that come into our offices to, to talk about these things. They just don't know. They just don't know. Right. And I think it's still a gray area right now. We talked about that prior to the show today that uh, we don't know how this is going to be enforced. Mm -hmm. So now we have a recreational medical uh, or a recreational marijuana law can you just give us a nuts and bolts in 30 seconds, tell our audience basically what Proposal 1 says? <laughs> well, the immediate effect tomorrow is that uh, anyone over the age of 21 can possess 10 ounces, up to 10 ounces of usable marijuana, which is the, the bud form or extracts or gummies. I mean, there's, there's all different forms. Um, but you still have to use it on private property uh, or not in public places. And one of the biggest issues that are going to come up is the operating under the influence of drugs. Um, most law enforcement officers I know, especially locally, are glad that they don't have to deal with this anymore. But there's still a group, a uh, select group of few of them who think that this is, you may have won the battle, but you're going to lose the war on, on drugs. Yeah. And therefore, they're going to make it their mission to stamp out anybody uh, who has marijuana in their system while driving. And let me ask you this, uh, Bruce, with respect to how marijuana is being used. You know, I, I go back to the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and uh, I always tell a story that um, I've had people beat their wives on alcohol. Mm -hmm. I've had people shoot somebody for looking at them wrong uh, on cocaine. And I've had somebody had a million dollars stolen, uh, and they were smoking marijuana, and they said, dude, you, you effed me. Yeah. And uh, so people are pretty mellow on it, but the visual that I have of marijuana is the old uh, zigzag papers and people smoking it. Mm -hmm. And what if I live in an apartment complex and I don't want to smell it uh, with my neighbor, or I am at a college dorm and I don't want to smell it when I'm trying to study if I'm a student somewhere? Are people still smoking marijuana, or is it mostly edibles and gummies and liquids and things like that? Well, there's a if you know, yeah. There, yeah. There, <laughs> well, actually, I do. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, there, there's a uh, an ever widening range of products. Um, smoking marijuana is, you know, obviously, if you're smoking something, it's not that healthy. There are other forms of ingestion that are far more healthy and less uh, adverse uh, later down the road for symptoms for the body. But um, you know. As far as campuses and schools, uh, all the universities in the state of Michigan have taken an opt-out policy. Um, despite it being legal and there really being no criminal penalties, the university is going to be uh, imposing their own penalties for people who get caught possessing it, even if you're over 21 and you're compliant with the law. They don't want it on campuses, and I mm -hmm. think that that's an important distinction that education comes first and, and people need to be respected. But again, that goes back to the adult use. If you're using it like an adult, uh, then you're going to be respectful and mindful of others. Same situation with a landlord. Um, there was legislation passed during the Medical Marijuana Act that allowed landlords to either say yes or no to a patient uh, 
either using and possessing cannabis or a caregiver who is seeking to cultivate on their property. Mm -hmm. Landlords have the right to say yes or no and, uh, to a proposed tenant. So if you're in that situation, um, it's best to get some legal advice to start and then be having an open and honest discussion with your landlord. So breaking it down, two answers that you gave that I think are very uh, good for our audience. Number one, and going to Michigan Stadium and watch a Michigan football game, there are signs up there that say no smoking even for medical purposes. So obviously yeah. Michigan uh, has taken the stance that marijuana is not going to be allowed on campus. So that's something that each person should probably check on any school, institution, or public uh place. You would agree with that? Absolutely. It's very important. And um, my understanding is that just about every university in the state of Michigan so far has very quickly said, you know, we recognize that this is legal, but we're still going to respect the academic environment of the university and, and protect that for people who don't choose to participate. So that may satisfy some people that were against the bill. And the second thing is what you talked about to our audience is about a landlord. A landlord would have the right to say, I don't want you to live in my apartment complex. I don't want you to live in my rental home if, in fact, you're using marijuana. Is that the way the law stands? Well, the current sta state of the law is that. But, you know, I, f I find that a little troubling because it seems awfully discriminatory and um, open to bias. You know, uh, there's, there's fair housing acts in the United States that protect people from being discriminated against for housing purposes. And I think, again, the state of the law in legalization um, is one thing, but the, the rest of the law, banking law, um, you know, landlord-tenant uh, issues, property laws, those laws haven't caught up to the pace of legalization movements in the United States. I mean, we now have over 27, 28 states, I think, and maybe a couple more just added it as, as uh, last November. So, you know, that progress is happening very rapidly, and we have states to look as examples for California, Colorado, to see how it's unrolled for them. And quite honestly, we're in, here in Michigan are in a great position because we're just lagging far enough behind Colorado to use that test case and try to harness the power of the industry and the good things here while making some adjustments to eliminate some of the more negative impacts that are perceived by you know, law enforcement. Sure, and I'll go to the pulse of the people over here, Miss Lindsay Liu. Uh, do you want to live in a place where people are smoking marijuana? I mean, what, how do you feel about that as far as if you're a non-user and uh, you have that smell that I you hate smell. the smell. Okay, so I, I mean, is it something Being that... Being honest, oh, I do. It's both the best and the worst thing about marijuana. If you like marijuana, <laughs> that smell is wonderful, but if yeah. you yeah. don't, it's just like, hey, I'm over it's here. It's just I mean, like, it's, it's very, flag. you know, it's prominent. You can, yeah. if you go out and you smell it, you're like, oh, there it is. I know somebody's lighten up somewhere well but. it had a different smell after a while when you're growing up and you mm. go to old atwood stadium and uh you know the bathrooms would be filled with marijuana smoke it, it smelled yeah. and then i was out in colorado skiing one time yeah. and it smelled like a skunk yeah it's, like yeah. a literal like different. an actual skunk yeah, yeah but definitely. you know now in the, the demographics are, are vastly changing as well for users and you know the old baby boomers now who were grew up you know anti-drugs and just say no are coming around to really realizing that they can exchange a handful of these pill medications that yeah. have you know horrible side effects that you have to take another pill for the side effects right. uh, and exchange some or all of those for medical cannabis and it's one of the least invasive uh, treatments that that they have found to be very effective and that also spreads right into the other forms of ingestible marijuana the vapor pens they don't give off those kind of you know real noxious powerful That's odors powerful scent. Yeah. Um, so the vapor pens are very discreet uh, as well as the edibles i mean uh, the the majority of people that i've dealt with um, that fit the baby boomer type generation or uh, the older generations now for home care for physical therapy purposes and things like that they really prefer the edibles like or, the the, or the oils and, and, and vapor pens yeah. because it's very discreet nobody right. nobody would ever know that you're using it mm -hmm. well this is uh very very important for our listening audience and our viewers in that you've talked about colleges and universities and public institutions you've talked about uh, landlords and what they may be able to do and before we finish up our show here, I want you to address the operating under the influence of drugs and how you feel and what we're hearing the police are going to do and how much is enough to get somebody pulled over for a drinking and driving type of charge. Could you just touch on that? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm glad you brought that up again because to me that's the most important uh, factor and risk factor for people that they need to understand about the new law. 
um, operating under the influence of marijuana is going to be, in my opinion, one of the biggest and most prosecuted cases in the next upcoming years. It's an area that there really is a lack of foundational science and peer-reviewed study on the impacts of marijuana and driving. But we see all these drug recognition experts and all these police officers are going to drug recognition school sure. right now so they can see if somebody's under the influence of marijuana. How much does it take in somebody's system of the active ingredient THC mm -hmm. to be arrested and charged with operating under the influence of drugs in Michigan? Well, that's the million dollar question, Mike. And honestly, it's very difficult to put a number similar to uh, what would equate to a 0 0.08 for alcohol. So no arbitrary number is out there right now. Currently, there's been discussions from anywhere from five to 10 nanograms of active THC in your system. But here's the big catch. Let me stop you there. How high would you be at five to 10 nanograms? I don't think very much at all. Okay. Mm. Um, generally speaking, when marijuana is ingested, you'll have a spike up to 50, 100, 150 uh, nanograms of active THC. But rather than alcohol, which kind of follows a curve, marijuana has a spike and then it drops off in a, in a slope off to, you know, going back down to zero. Does your body weight have anything to do with that? Yeah, absolutely. Body weight type, same as alcohol. Okay. I mean, a uh, 100 pound uh, beautiful assistant would, uh, you know, be able to drink a couple of drinks and, and feel pretty good. Or someone my size <laughs> I'd be dead. Uh, would, would, have, <laughs> would have a few and, and, you know, just be warming up or, right. or it's feeling the effects. But with marijuana, you have an instant spike and then it tails off. Mm -hmm. And so... The, the length of time in that, you know, the active THC is at a level where you're feeling the effects or intoxicated generally can be three to four hours. Uh, but the, all of the, the, the flaw in the, in the prosecution by the police is that all of these drug tests that they administer test for the metabolite. And the metabolite is what's in your system for a month or two. Even right. though you haven't used mm -hmm. marijuana, you didn't smoke it, you're not high, um, the tests and all of the drug tests other than a blood test all test for metabolite. Now, they've got these roadside swab tests, and they did a pilot program in Michigan, but I'm not aware of one case being brought to the courts um, that used those swab tests as a basis because we right. know the scientific principle of Daubert uh, and passing reliability and, and, and scientific principle as a, uh, you know, a court tool for evidence uh, is simply not going to be met with these tests. They're, yeah. they're just, uh, there isn't the science behind it yet. So what so, we really need to tell our audience out there from two criminal defense lawyers is that any amount of marijuana in your system, as the law is today, if that THC, the active ingredient, is in there, and they do a blood test, and you're operating a motor vehicle on a road accessible to the public, you risk prosecution, even though marijuana is legal. That's correct. And, you know, it's really unfortunate because that doesn't mean you're under the influence. I mean, similar to having one drink and driving home. Mm -hmm. You're not buzzed. You're not impaired. Um, you're under the legal limit and you're allowed to do that. And I think under the new law, it's not just a zero tolerance policy where any amount would result in prosecution. I think it will vary, again, mm -hmm. county to county, city by city, whether the prosecutor is going to pursue these cases. But having, you know, uh, the, the, the larger the amount that they find in your blood, the more you're going to be looking into getting prosecuted. Right. Mm -hmm. And then now you're talking about what, what are the levels of impairment? What are the signs of impairment? Okay, I mean... Red bloodshot eyes, the horizontal gaze and stagnus, the one-legged stand, the walk and turn. Those standardized field sobriety tests are designed for alcohol. And as you mm -hmm. know, I'm sure you're certified in those as well in administering those tests. Those are designed to detect alcohol. Right. And most police are using those to try to, to guess and detect marijuana. Mm -hmm. So I would say the simplest way of avoiding uh, problems for our, our listeners is don't smoke in your car and don't possess anything that smells in your car. If your right. car doesn't smell when you get pulled over... Uh, your chances of having a negative interaction with the police related to marijuana are probably next to nothing. Um, and I would agree with you there. Bruce, uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, being on Manley's Law, uh, my podcast. Uh, again, we're high atop the Mount Foundation building today. today. <laughs> and uh, today is December 4th that we're uh, actually recording this, or December 5th, tomorrow it goes into effect. And I think that uh, I would love to have you back on this show and we're going to need to keep in touch with Bruce Leach to know how this law is going to be affecting our citizens. So again, I want to thank you for being on Manley's Law. Please come back and join us. I want to thank hey. uh, my co-host today, Miss Lindsay Liu, the Pulse of the People. And I want to thank everybody uh, again <laughs> for being part of Manley's Law.